Hi friends, Ethan Sawyer, College Essay Guy here. My goal is to bring more ease, joy, and purpose into the college application process. This is the College Essay Guy podcast, where it's normally my job to interview the most brilliant minds in the college admissions world, analyze their genius, and break it down into actionable, practical steps that you can take, whether you're applying to college or helping someone else apply. Now, I said that's normally my job because this episode's gonna be a little different. On this episode, I interview an old friend of mine whose name is Ben Mathis, and he's the founder of something called the Urban Confessional, which is a free listening project. Now, what do I mean by that? A few years ago, Ben started posting up outside bus stops and street corners with a sign that read free listening, and he would just do that, you know, just listen. And over the last couple of years, it's really ignited and it's, it's created something of a movement. And Urban Confessional is now in 73 countries. It's got 2,000 volunteers. It's been featured in the Huffington Post, Atlantic, Fast Company, Big Think, Glamour Magazine, and over 45 international publications. Uh, Ben's blog called How to Listen When You Disagree has been read over 2 million times, been republished in over 100 publications around the world. And currently, Urban Confessional is the subject of a PBS-produced documentary called Are We Listening?, And this year, Ben launched the Herd podcast, which features honest conversations from visionaries, leaders, and other interesting people. On this episode, I talk with Ben about how Urban Confessional got its start in the first place. Like, why did it even begin? Uh, What he's learned about listening over the last few years, how these lessons have impacted his relationships, and even what it was like to do free listening at last year's Republican and Democratic National Conventions. At the end, he offers a really great resource called the Practice Partner Guide, which is really neat. It's got some great practical tips for listening. It's amazing stuff from an amazing human being. And like I said, it's kind of a different take for this podcast, but I think you'll see that the applications uh, include and, and go far beyond the college application process. So enjoy. Welcome. This is going to be an unusual episode. Now, normally I kind of script things out or at least have a set of questions. Today, I don't have a set of questions. Today, all I have is a title. And the title for this podcast is how to listen and why. And my guest is Ben Mathis. And um, Ben and I go back we, we maybe 12 years. We went to graduate school together. And God, we, we didn't, like you, Ben was just talking about how he saw on his Facebook profile like pictures of us being silly. And like we're, we're growing up together and not growing up together, which I really appreciate. So um, where should we begin? Um, Ben, what are you what are you up to these days? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, That's not a very interesting uh, question. But Let me ask you a better question. Yeah, like, can I actually just put you on the spot for a second? Yep, yep. yep. Um, so I have this list of brave and interesting questions, yep. and I want to just peg you with one of them. I want to hear it. Okay. So, what was the toughest decision you made last year? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> The toughest decision I made last year, um, I there there are two I think, um, and they're in different. I don't mean to compartmentalize my life so much, but there were some tough decisions I made around um, some of the choices around my business and things, um, and that was really a, a tough decision to commit to them, to commit to growing what I do, and then there were some tough personal decisions I made, and that was. Uh, mostly driven by a commitment to move on from a very long-term relationship that I was in. You notice how vague he's keeping it here? I'm keeping it very vague. Keeping it real safe. Because <laughs> I'm not sure who's going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, both both of my most, disif- most difficult decisions were um, around committing to something. Can you get... Get a little bit more specific. You Absolutely, don't, yeah. No, of so course, I can get all the way but. specific. I'm, I'm, this is me just working it through in my mind. Um, so I, I run an acting studio, and I also run a, a movement uh, around free listening, and which we're going to get to. It's part, part of why I'm here. I wanted to get. I wanted to get, <laughs> get him in the get, back get, of the head. Of of it. <laughs> <laughs> so both of those, I, I've been very safe with, and I, I really decided to commit financially, emotionally. Um, strategically to growing those things, which which was a huge commitment. Um, and then on, on the personal side, and you can't disconnect these two, it's just how my brain's operating to get to the connection. I started compartmentalized and I'm working down to the connection. Um, but but 
on the personal side, a, a relationship I was in with, with my girlfriend ended after about five years, four and a half, five years. And that was kind of like, you ever have somebody like, just like, what was that movie? It's like Indiana Jones where he just reaches into your chest <laughs> and grabs your heart. <laughs> and, it's like, and it was kind of like that. Mm-hmm. And, and so I had to make some decisions about, I had to first make decisions about that I was going to accept this and move on and, and begin the healing process. So as opposed to deciding that I was going to um, more, you know, wallow in it or, or allow it to um, level me in a yeah. way. So I had to choose to, I had to choose growth. I had to choose that. And that is not the decision I would have preferred to make, frankly, yeah. because it would have felt really good to sit and, and, and kind of bathe in the feeling sorry and the anger and all of the negative things. And I, I absolutely experienced them, but I had to choose to allow them to come in and to ke- and let them keep going. You mentioned healing mm-hmm. and I'm curious about healing, what healing looks like to you. What, what do you do to heal? Um, okay. This is, well, that's a huge question, but for me, I can't, I, I have a hard time and, and I have a hard time disconnecting healing from something, which I might say as growth. Um, I might say as learning, I, it's not like I'm, uh, fixing necessarily, but I'm, I'm taking what's happened and I'm growing from it. So I'm turning a tragedy into a beauty in mm-hmm. some way. Something horrible happens to me and if I can learn from it and allow it to affect me and then I can create something beautiful from it, I kind of go, oh, I think I've healed. Mm-hmm. And it's because I've transformed what it was into something else. Um, and what do you do to do that? Like what are some tools or right. resources? That For you me, use? it's impossible. And I don't know if this is right. This is just what I got right now. To, to, for me... It's impossible to disconnect healing from serving other people. Hmm. And anytime that somebody comes to me and they feel lost or confused or they're broken or something is happening in their life, sometimes the first question I ask is, who are you serving? And there's something about serving others. Not that we shouldn't pay attention to ourselves and, and, and work on ourselves, but I think sometimes this idea that I can't engage with others until I help myself, mm-hmm. um, sometimes that becomes addictive. And so we never engage with others. And, and sometimes I find the best way to work on myself is by working with others and, and taking the attention off of myself and, and placing myself in a place of humility where I'm here to serve you actually has a restorative mm-hmm. thing to me. Do you ever find the opposite to be true, that you're focused more on others than yes yes that's the shadow side <laughs> that's the shadow side and i've been there too and that's that's part of it that savior complex where it's like i'm just focusing on you as a form of avoiding what's going on in me it's not me it's you <laughs> it's not me it's not me it's you <laughs> it's not me it's you it's not so th- like with everything there's there's balance here and, it, and it's all about the intention but i know that the greatest things in my life have come from the the lowest lows in my life mm-hmm. and it was when i was at the very bottom that i turned and i it's not like I looked out to find distraction. I looked out to find others. And it was like I was positioning in myself in this ultimate humility where I said, look, I don't have anything, but with the nothing I have, I can meet, I can, I can embrace my weakness and meet you in your weakness and we can find a communion together that is healing. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to keep going. I'm just going to keep just going. Oh, okay. just like hit me in what, the back of the head. Talk to me about your lowest lows. Like, yeah. let's start there. Yeah. Where, give me a, a, one of the big challenges that you faced. Yeah. Um, I have several. <laughs> I have many. Um, one of them, uh, maybe the most profound for me, that has taught me the most, um, was, was um, w- when I left my wife. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, really. I mean, I've had many since, but... That really was, and it still is something that I feel, I, I look at who I was then, and I'm not proud of who I was, I'm not proud of the things I said or did, and it it really, if, if you have those moments where it's kind of like, oh, wow, the rug has come out, yeah. <laughs> there is no more rug, there is no safety net, um, and I was forced to look at, I was forced to look at my imperfections, I was forced to reevaluate who I thought I was, mm. I was forced to come to terms with my weaknesses and my vulnerability. And I think it was the really, it was, it was a, 
it was a conversion moment for mm. me. And it, it was a sacrifice that I put her through. Wow. And was not, I would not want to do that again. Take me through the, give me the darkness of the night. Like, what were the effects of that in your life? Like, what impact did right. that have on you? Well, it, um, I went through a period of, of kind of, I think, I went through a period, I was working with a counselor, I, I knew something was off. Yeah. So my, I was calibrated enough to know that I'm not right. Something's going on. And I was just running from problems, is what mm. I was doing. And I was not facing them. I was not admitting to myself that I was capable of making mistakes. Yeah. That, was, that was the first thing. And I had justified so many things in my life that were keeping me from really connecting with the person I wanted to connect with the most. Yeah. And, you know, I was blaming her and I was blaming other circumstances. And, all, you know, just you, you start looking around like, it's not me. It's got to be everybody else. Right. Um, I was very self-serving. I was concerned only with me and what I was doing. And, and my life became very much around me yeah. and pursuing my own needs. And um, when, when I kind of came to terms with that, leaving my wife was uh, not necessarily where the lesson lived. That was just in the reaction. I didn't know right. how to deal, so I left. I didn't know how to listen, so I left. I didn't know how to see, so I left. Yeah. I didn't know how to be present, so I just left. Yeah. And then in the aftermath of that, when things started to settle, I started to, to really become, I, I started to reinvestigate my spiritual life, my physical life, my mental life. And I started really to see that if I was going to become the man that I was hoping to become, that I had to do some real searching. And it led to... Um, this discovery that that serving other people can have a healing effect, yeah. and that serving other people can can position me in a type of humility that allowed me to see myself in them, yeah. and allowed me to realize that the very thing that I was looking for was I was not getting it, but not because it wasn't being offered. I wasn't getting it because I wasn't oh. open to receive it. And receiving is difficult for me. Like it still is. Like if I go out to dinner, like I want to pay. I want to pay for you. I want to. It's d receiving the generosity of others is not easy for me. Yeah. Um, and so, in learning to do that, and by using specifically free listening to do that, yeah. which is kind of what came from this, um, it put me in places where I had to challenge my own availability. Yeah. I had to challenge my own willingness to sit with people in their discomfort, which allowed me, which allowed my own discomfort to be reflected back to me. Mm. And I learned how to be with them and I learned how to be with myself. Yeah. I mean, so I'm hearing the need for connection, the need for vulnerability. You didn't say this, but like the need for presence. The need for presence. Yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that, that's very, it's great the need to be present with, with myself and with others and with circumstance and just the need to step into acceptance yeah. of these things. Because I, I was, I couldn't, I couldn't accurately tell my story either. Like, who was I? I don't know. I mean, I still don't know, but I know. But until I could honestly sit with the things that I might consider a shadow mm -hmm. or until I could understand that that shadow is as much a part of my self is my light and that these things can't necessarily be separated. Yeah. I can't just want the good stuff. Right. <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, of course that's all I want, but I, but I, <laughs> I can't just live for as if, and that's what I was doing. I was turning my back on all of the things. Yeah. And that just made them grow. Yeah. That just made them grow. And right. so I was making decisions from that place, which I, I, you know, and as soon as I began to understand and incorporate and go, yeah, I'm, I'm the totality of the light and the dark in this sense that I've got it all. Then I started, then I became more familiar with it, became less scared of it, and it had less of a control over my decision making. Wow. So I'm hearing in that acceptance of all the parts, more parts of yourself. Yeah. You said the light and the dark. So what'd you do about it? Well, I, that's the, you know, maybe this is a good time to segue into this. For me, um, I hit a moment outside of a liquor store um, where I, I finally called somebody and I finally, I was talking to a counselor, but I, you know, that has, which was a beautiful thing, but that kind of had a, a framework where there was some expectation and I felt kind of safe in that space. But I finally called somebody else and I said, hey man, I, I need to talk. 
And that, that phone call, that, the raising of your hand and saying, I need help, mm-hmm. is, that's, like, that's the hardest. I'm not, then that, the strength it takes to raise your hand, I, I, don't know, I don't know if you can get that in a gym. I mean, you might be a star football player, but the strength to raise your hand and say, I need help, that's a whole, that's next level strength. And just doing that and then having that received on the other end of the phone. And why was it particularly difficult for you? Because for some people, I could see it being easier. Right, right. What was it about um, who, uh, you that made that? I think, I think for me, I've never felt like I, I, I felt pretty autonomous. I felt pretty, I can do this on my own. I felt, I've always felt like I had it together. And so admitting help in my mind, I don't believe this now, but was admitting a weakness. Mm-hmm. And in my mind at the time, weakness was not good. Mm-hmm. And now I understand weakness as actually the greatest strength, really. And, you know, when I think of the things that matter, tenderness, compassion, love, listening, they kind of require that we reacquaint ourselves with what strength is. Mm-hmm. And we, the ability to meet someone, like I said, in their weakness and to be okay with my weaknesses um, actually is the greatest form of strength, I think. Yeah. And, you know, the, the things that require the type of strength we're used to are often destructive. And, and you know, uh, and I, I want to be strong physically. I want to be strong in these things, of course, because it's healthy, I suppose. But, um, but the real inner strength comes, I think, from weakness. Mm-hmm. And I was not okay with that. Yeah. So calling somebody and being like, I need help was hard. Yeah. And... Because I, I think I also assumed that it meant there's something wrong with me, that there was something and there wasn't anything wrong right. with me. Um, so when I did that, uh, and then I was heard, I was listened to, and I thought, wow, I feel better. What just <laughs> happened? Somebody listened to me. This is wild. And I really thought, um, I, you know, I felt this connection. And, and then one day I was crossing the street and a homeless guy needed money really, and I didn't have anything, so I didn't have any money really to give him. And But I said that I would sit with him, I'd pray with him, I'd be with him, and that's what I did. And I thought, whoa, I just took that leap into vulnerability. I just took that leap huh. into communion with another person, a stranger, and it felt awesome. Wow. And it felt great. And I was like, this, I need to practice this. I need to know more about this. I don't know what this is about in my relation. I don't know what this is about with the people I'm close to. I definitely don't know what it's about with strangers. So, so then I made a free list. I thought, what's the closest thing to free prayer that I can do with somebody um, that might be more accessible to everyone? And I thought free listening might be. So I did. So I made a sign, and I stood on a street corner with some friends in my acting studio, and, and I did free listening. And that was about five years ago. And then it's just never stopped. And now... It's become a huge part of my life and been a huge um, platform for me to explore my own weaknesses and to let go of control and to be with people and create a hospitable environment for others, which has helped me create a hospitable environment for myself. What have you learned about how to listen? Well, what I've learned about listening, really, is that it is not a how-to. It is not a tactic Mm. for me. It's not something I do to get something I want. Um, it's, a, it's a practice. It's mm-hmm. like yoga. It's a posture. It's a lens that you put in your life glasses. <laughs> it's good. the way you see things. And, um, and I, I say that not to avoid that question at all, but, but because I really believe it. And I see a lot of people talk about listening. I mean, if you want to Google how to listen, there's, there's, there's steps that you can take. Mm-hmm. And everybody has kind of the same things to say about it, you know? I mean, the first thing is shut up, (laughs) you know, Um, and and listen to the, you know, but it's tough to teach people something they know how to do Mm -hmm. already. And so there's absolutely useful things that you can say, do these things, do this thing. But to me, it's a practice and we have to understand it as that first. I'm not always good at it. And and listening is not just something that happens with my ears. I can listen with my gut. I can listen Mm -hmm. with my body. I can listen, even while I'm speaking, I can be listening and taking in what you're giving me as I speak. So for me, it begins with that recognition that it's a practice. Mm-hmm. It's not a tactic. Um, and for me also, it really, when I give someone my attention, I like to, I say it like this, so this is not just on the spur of the moment. This is actually something I've thought about uh, and it's clever. So it's catchy. So it's right. 
<laughs> so it must be correct. It's clever. Um, but but the way I, I, I really think about it is, is I give you my attention instead of imposing my intention. Mm. And when I give you my attention, it's like I'm paying attention to you. I'm, I'm offering something. It's a giving. I'm not trying to control this moment. I'm not trying to respond. I'm not trying to be right. I'm not trying to sell you. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just giving you my attention, which is actually more valuable than anything else I can give you, really. So I'm, I'm interested in you. I'm curious. I'm going to ask questions. Um, I ask a lot of questions when I'm listening to people. Mm. I try to keep what I call an imbalanced conversation, so 80% you, 20% me. That's good. Talking and you know, 80 or maybe it's 70, whatever it is. It's more you than it is me. 70, 70 80, <laughs> something like that. What are some of your favorite questions? Uh, Do you have some go-to ones? Yeah, oh yeah, I've definitely got go-to. Actually, my my favorite question to ask people, and it's something I usually ask at the beginning, is where are you from? Huh. And it it sounds like... Why is that? Why do you love that question? I love that question because it often gets people talking about themselves. Whether sometimes it's like, oh, I'm from Minnesota, or or you know, or they or they might say, I'm from this little bitty town somewhere, and that always lets me if I'm listening closely. I, they may not like where they're from, and that, and then I can hear that, and then that, that might open up something that, you know, mm. to tell me more about that. What's that about? And that can that can get them talking, or it might be they love where they're from, which is a great place to start, also. And mm. and it often gives me a rapport because I like to travel, so maybe I've been there, and I can say how much I love, you know, the Pacific Northwest, and or maybe I've never been there, but I've always wanted to go there, right. and it, it gives me the opportunity to open up some interest in them. Mm. Um, but I think that where we're from, if we ask ourselves, where am I from and what is my association to that? What does it mean to me? I think we can start to really open up some stuff in, in the person. So I always, I always open up with that. It always gets people talking. Yeah. It also helps me establish rapport with them because I like where I'm from. I mean, I think it's unique and interesting and, and, you know, we can always start talking about that and it. If you listen closely when someone answers that question, you're going to hear a lot of stuff. Mm. You're going to hear a lot of stuff. They may talk about their family, their friends. They may not talk at all about it. Where are you from? New York. Ooh, wow. That's <laughs> okay. Right. right. All right. Well, maybe maybe we won't go there. Maybe we maybe we should go there. Um, so, I mean, it, I hope that doesn't... That's my favorite question to ask people. I love that question. And when you have that moment of, like, maybe we won't go there, maybe we should go there, what do you weighing what's telling you i'm weighing two things <laughs> i'm weighing i actually the first thing i'm weighing is do i want to go there frankly um uh, do i feel like i have time and patience right now to go there and i hate to say that but it's true because i would not want to go there not feeling like i'm willing to go there because then i'm not really listening very well however there are times that i want to challenge that in myself too like i don't really want to go there but you know what it sounds like my discomfort around this is less important than your need to talk about it. Mm. So, bing, uh, bing, bing. yeah. So wow. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sacrifice my needs right now for comfort and actually be with you, um, which is back to that healing aspect of of service where I'm going. And then I discover, you know what, my discomfort's not all that important. Mm. And and then I go, man, I, I sure am glad that for a second. I reevaluated what I felt like I needed and I gave into what someone else needed and I found that maybe I didn't need that thing to begin with. Mm. Um, and then the other thing I evaluate is, you know, whether or not, and, and it's just intuition, I don't know how to measure it, maybe you can speak more articulately around it, but whether or not that person wants to talk about that. You know, I never want to manipulate someone into saying right. something they don't want because listening is not a tactic to get what I want. One of the, my brother is a, uh, among many things, he was a chaplain in the Navy for a while. And he, he wrote a quote once, I, I'll paraphrase it, but he said that we have to allow people to reveal themselves, to reveal themselves, if they will, uh, or, or when they will, how they will, and if they will. Oof, that's good. You know, and I, I know I've spent, listening has taught me to just allow them to lead the conversation. And if I'm listening closely, I can help move it. But... Um, not everybody's going to reveal themselves, and I have to. I, that's okay. I, I've got to give up my need for them to reveal themselves or yeah. some kind of thing, you know. Boy, the way that's landing for me, as a as the college essay guy, is like one of the things when I'm working with a student one on one is that we have unlimited sessions, mm-hmm. so it allows for that space. Yeah, 
but we've also got a deadline. Yeah, yeah. Of November 31st. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever the deadline is. Yeah. 30 days of arrangement. No, no, not November 31st, November 30th, or December 31st, or January, whatever it is, where it's kind of like, sure, we've got plenty of time, but also... If we got to get going. we got to get going. Yeah. So what I'm noticing as you're saying that is that while I'm really in line, aligned with that desire that you just spoke of, like that's the higher aim for me. Yep. There's also this other thing <laughs> in my work that I'm doing with students and I'm like trying to do a thing, you know, that has an, an outcome, which is to write a personal statement um, that you'll send to a college. So, Well, I think, I think that's great because to me, um, the aha moment is, oh, I can allow people to reveal themselves. And with that aha moment, now what do I do to help them to feel confident so that they reveal themselves? Well, and, and know, that's the thing. The other thing is that there's a little bit of extra juice that comes from the deadline. Yeah, yeah. Where folks and students that I work with are a little more willing to be like, all right, well, we... We got to get going. We got to get going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm just on the street with people, and right. there's no deadline. There's no anything except for that I'm tired or it's hot outside, you know. Uh, Boy, I, one more thing this makes me think of is when we used to take Zola, my daughter, for a walk when she was, you know, whatever, 10 months old, or when she was just learning how to walk. We would go for walks, and it would take us forever to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I realized it was because she didn't know that we were going somewhere. Whoa, wow, that's awesome. She was just walking. That's awesome. And enjoying walking. That's beautiful. That's and, beautiful. And in my life, with my wife, all that strife, no. I just want to let it run. Is that a knife? Oftentimes um, will be playing with Zola in a way that I see, like, they're not going anywhere. Like, yeah. they're just playing. Just playing. And just being in presence in the moment. And I, for somebody who thinks he's pretty present, I realize I've just got still so much uh, work to do. I, that's, I mean, if we learn anything from children and dogs, <laughs> <laughs> it's how to just play for the sake of play. Oh, you were going to say how to be goal directed? Uh, how to be goal directed. How to be trained. It's potty training. It's well, what we learn from dogs and children. Yeah. yeah. And, and my practice each day now is like, how do I go from eight hours of consistent goal driven efficiency and productivity to just boom, shut it off and then be in play mode yeah and yeah. and not try and clean up the house at the same time because i'm really excited to do that a lot of yeah, yeah 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 let's make a game of cleaning up the house <laughs> exactly right <laughs> yeah, that's great. Ooh, or, or when she's playing and i see she's distracted i'll start to pick things up so that i'm not being fully present with yeah her. yeah what i'm curious here's, this leads to another question because i just shared one of the things that's like you know in drama because i've been and i studied drama together they say drama is the the it's two loves coming into conflict, like mm. two things. When, when you're either when you're listening or if you want to share in life, what do you see in terms of two values that, are, that come into big conflict for you? Like two things that you love, and it's hard to do them at the same time. Two things I love that are hard to do at the same time. Um, oh my gosh. Um, to to okay. Two things I love that are hard to do at the same time is one is to just be with somebody, mm. and and also not want to fix them. Talk to me about that. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a fixer. Like, it's hard for me to be presented with problem that I don't want to engage in. And and listening has taught me that actually just by, by allowing someone to be who they are in my presence, that... Often that's that's enough. Like I don't have to fix it. It's not on me to fix. I don't have to be responsible for them. But I often experience the need to want to do that, and then I rationalize that need by being like, "Well, I can help you. I can help you. I can help you." And then it's about me again. <laughs> you know, it's a, sometimes mm -hmm. it's about me, and sometimes the person is asking for help, and I still don't. I can't offer it because the help, the lesson you need, can only be learned by you going through this. I can't get you around this. I can't get you under this. You have to go through something. How do you manage that when you when the thought comes up, flickers up, ooh, here's a thing. I, I allow that thought. I, I go, I, I have the recognition and um, I just control whether or not I say something, really. Because, look, you know, I as a, as a teacher or any, I, I can see... You know, if I'm, I, I teach acting, and so if I, I see a scene, I can see a thousand things that can be fixed on that scene. You know, anybody can see the things that we can improve. It's, it's, I think real wisdom comes from listening, being quiet, uh, and, and then getting the feedback from the actors and then addressing not the symptoms, 
you know, not the many things that I can see, but listening so closely that perhaps I can, I can finally hear the very core, the very bottom thing, that if we address that bottom, everything else will align. Mm-hmm. And when I'm listening to people on the street, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to listen to the deepest, uh, I'm trying to listen to the deepest version of who they are. Mm-hmm. And the more that I try to fix the, the, the symptoms of what they're saying or mm-hmm. fix the symptoms of their thing, I, I'm not gonna get to the bottom of who they are. Mm-hmm. They won't reveal that ever. Because we'll get caught up in the management of who they are, and not in the essence of who they are. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. Because well, I, I, well, it answers uh, a different question, and you can just say "see above" if you want for this question. But what has free listening and the free listening movement taught you? What have you been able to bring into your with your acting students as you're teaching acting? Oh man! Oh gosh! Free listening is like the greatest acting training ever, and that's not how it. That's not why it was developed, but it does several things. So free listening takes the attention off of me, and puts it onto you. And if there's anything an actor needs, is a little less attention on themselves, <laughs> <laughs> which is actually a lot of acting teachers talk about. You know, a lot of teachers talk about you know it's about the other person, it's about the other person, but then it, their techniques are totally opposite of that. So mm-hmm. acting training so often became about. What can I do to put the attention on the other person? Right. And it was always still, a, what's your objective? What's your, and all right. this crap that acting teachers talk about so that you can control this moment. Right. Even though it's wrapped in this kind of beautiful, it's freeing the moment to understand the moment. And I'm like, I don't know if it is. Right. In, in the free listening experience, we actually get out of the classroom and you're actually face-to-face with all of your own stuff. And you're face to face with you don't with with somebody who you can't predict. So you do not know what's going to come to you. Yeah. If anything comes to you, and so one of the things that when people go free listening in in the workshops that I do afterwards, we talk a lot about what happened. And somebody will always say, "Nobody came and spoke to me, and I just wanted someone to come and talk to me." And and I felt lonely, and I felt ignored, and I felt like people weren't paying attention to me. And I we always process that and at the end of it usually we arrive at oh wait it's not about me it's i'm not i it's i'm not there to get things from other people i'm there to give things to other people and that is a huge lesson for artists and actors is that acting is not about what we receive acting is an offering Mm -hmm. it's a giving and in the giving is where we find our freedom where we find our power and we find in the giving of our art, we really are only going to discover things that someone who's that generous will ever discover. And so then, then you really understand it all differently. It's like, I'm not doing this to become famous or to get an applause. I'm not doing it for the audience. I'm not doing it. It's an offering to you. Then the work becomes unevaluatable because, I don't know, have you ever seen somebody like helping? Okay, someone's walking down the street and somebody falls and somebody runs out and picks them up. Like you would never stop and be like, you just did that wrong. It, like, yeah. yeah, you would never critique it. It's and like give it an eight. Give it, yeah, all right. It's like, no, <laughs> His form was a little right. It yeah. wasn't. It could have been better. What was your objective? Like you wouldn't do that. Right. And so when we position ourselves in that place of offering, uh, we discover a new level of freedom and a new depth to all of our work, whether it's writing or acting or or relationships. And I find that free listening is a unbelievable way to practice that offering. And and so. We take that then into our life or into our work. If I can practice offering myself to strangers, then I can practice offering myself to the people I'm closest to. Yeah. Which is sometimes harder. Yeah. What has it done for you in your life? Um, well, I, for me, it's, it's, it's shifted a lot of my relationships. You know, I've, if I can go back to when I was talking earlier about my low point, you know, and, and leaving my wife, I, I didn't know how to be with people in that tension. Mm. As soon as it got uncomfortable, I was out. And this has taught me how to be present with people, even when I'd prefer not to be. Yeah. To be present when it's unpleasant and to be there with them. Um, you know, I, I so I hope that next time I want to leave whatever it is, whether it's my wife or I want to leave this situation. This right? conversation. This conversation. <laughs> I won't keep you long. Don't keep me long. <laughs> that, that, that I can, um, I've practiced how to be present in that space and, and I can accept more of the totality, the wholeness of life, which includes the stuff I'd rather not acknowledge. Yeah. You know, so I can experience, I hope I can be present with the things that are uncomfortable and the things that are comfortable and, 
and actually eventually lose they lose those designations even I'm right. just, I, you know I just I'm trying to talk about it so until it really just becomes um, I'm just sitting with all of it because all of it is if it exists it belongs is one of the things that mm-hmm. one of the people I like to read Richard Rohr he, he says that if it exists it belongs and that is not how I was operating yeah because to me if it existed and I didn't like it it did not belong right <laughs> You know, which compartmentalized my life and and, um, and I wasn't listening because you can't really listen to something and compartmentalize it. That doesn't work. Right. Because then you'll only hear the things you like, like we do on Facebook. Yeah. You know, we just edit out the things we don't like and we just hear the stuff, more we the stuff you like. Give us more. And, and so it's put us in a place where disagreement's impossible, really. Um, we have, you know, po- political stuff going on right now and. And I know people who are very upset, and of course, and very angry, and that's fine, uh, of course. And but I know a lot of people also who are not listening, and and I know people who say that's how we got here because we weren't listening. And I know people who finally feel heard, and I know you know. So I mean, it it's it's a big thing. I've got two more questions for you. Yeah. One is, would you share just a little bit about what it was like? when you went to, was it the RNC or was it the DNC? The RNC, yeah. Will you yeah. share a little bit about doing free listening there? Yeah, we, we, we orchestrated free listening at the RNC and at the DNC, um, at the Republican National Convention and the Democrat National Convention for this last election. And uh, the conventions were last summer. Uh, I did not go to the DNC. I went to the RNC, and that was just because um, I, I had to choose one. I could only afford to go to one, so I went to the RNC. And, but, but I heard they were both very much alike. I mean, it, it's an unbelievable energy. It really is. It's really great. If you ever get a chance to go to these conventions, at least just to go outside, it's really exciting mm-hmm. because there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions and they're expressing them really creatively. <laughs> it's really cool, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it is not a place where everyone's there supporting the candidate. It's a place where most people there are not in support of the candidate. And and so you, there were people dressed up like walls, you know, protesting against Donald Trump, and there were people dressed up like babies running around doing kind of performance art things and making a point. And then there were people who were very much in support of the president, and they were saying things, you know, you had the the kind of Westboro Baptist type people there, and you just had everybody there. And actually, objectively, it was beautiful. I mean, it was like mm. free speech at its finest. I mean, mm. and it was, the, the, it was very safe. Uh, in this instance, the, the the police officers were from all over the country, mm-hmm. and they, you know, when somebody was saying something that was particularly inciting, um, they they just they would form a bicycle wall between. The, That's a bicycle wall. So, like, literally, these guys showed up and they had a megaphone and they were yelling some pretty uh, insulting things, frankly, um, and so people were yelling back at them, and so there was just these people yelling and people yelling. And it wasn't, I never felt unsafe, but the cops just very calmly on their bicycles uh. went in between the two disagreeing parties. And literally you had a wall of bicycle police and you had these two people yelling over them, two parties. So it was probably 50 people on either side. So maybe a hundred people just yelling at each other. Yeah. Um, and the cops just very calmly created a barrier between the two of them and let them yell at each other for an hour, and then they quit and moved on and did something else. I mean, it was fascinating. Wow. Um, and I will also say that there was more press than people, and the press were showing us all of the crazy yelling and screaming. But there was a lot of people just having real conversations, too. Mm. Um, and so I was there free listening. And um, that was where I really learned how to listen when you disagree with people. And... You, you, uh, you know, I, I wrote a blog about this, and, and so I, I kind of can highlight some things about it. But um, and we'll link to the blog. We link to the so. blog, yeah. But but ultimately, what happened was I, a lady came to me with a very strong opinion about abortion, and was telling me about this, and 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 I was just listening, and I think she thought I was going to disagree with her, and I did disagree with her, but uh, and I kind of felt that I'm going to disagree, and and instead I just asked her. I said, "How did you get to this opinion? What was your story?" And as soon as she started to tell me her story, um, there wasn't anything to disagree with. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was a different... I still don't agree with her opinion, mm-hmm. but I can't disagree with her person. Like, yeah. you know, then I'm tapping in. I'm hearing her heart. I'm not just hearing her thoughts. Yeah. And so disagreeing takes on a different thing. Yeah. And it's, you know, if, if 
if you're a Trump supporter or if you're not a Trump supporter or, or whatever it is, if you ask somebody who is on the other side of the aisle, let's say if you ask a Trump supporter, hey, can you tell me about what's causing you to support him? Mm -hmm. uh, you might, you may not, this person may not have thought about it, but you might hear, you know, well, look, I've been out of work. I've been right. in this, you know, you know, you might get to that place where you still don't have to agree with the choice they've made. Right. But you've gotten down to something human that you can listen to. And it, it's a starting place, yeah. you know, and then you can listen to them, you can disagree with them, but you're doing it from a different place. Yeah. You know, you just, you, you're, in fact, there's a, 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 a Heineken ad that just came out that's gone viral that's just about this exact thing. Yeah. About, hey, you know, at, at the core, we're all people. We want to be loved, we want to be acknowledged. And we have stories that shape the choices we make. Yeah. And when we get into that story, all of a sudden it's hard to say you made a bad choice. Yeah. You made a wrong choice. And it is not to say, I want to be very clear, it's not to say that we shouldn't disagree or that you shouldn't protest or stand up and express yourself. And But it, you know, um, it, it gives us a beginning place that's a little less reactionary, perhaps. Last question. Why do you do what you do? I really do believe that the world is walking around and does not realize how beautiful it is. Uh, the people in the world are walking around and they don't realize how beautiful they are. They don't realize how significant they can be. And I, I, I want people to know that they're valued. I want people to know that they matter and that they can offer something in the world because I can only imagine if we had six billion people who knew that, how much better things could be. Um, I think that's, I mean, that really, I mean, really, really, that, that's it. That's the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. It was really, really wonderful to sit down with Ben again. And keep in mind, you can find the show notes at collegeessayguide.com slash podcast. You'll see a list of all the episodes I've done and the practical guides that go along with them. Until next time, stay curious. <laughs>